In the early 1990s, a time of booming capitalism and rampant consumerism, a new era unfolded. Technology and the internet were in their infancy, birthing a wave of tech careers and economic growth. As inflation dropped, the entertainment industry, especially children's media, had flourished. Disney reigned supreme, birthing beloved cartoons that still hold power today. Remember the digital pet crazes of Tamagotchi and Pokemon? They were just the tip of the iceberg. Every cereal box in aisle 3 boasted our favorite cartoon characters, spoiling us for choice. This golden age of media shaped a generation, instilling in us an enduring love for the shows and characters that influenced our formative years. It became cool to rock a Rugrats t-shirt in your 30s. The nostalgia that fills our hearts when we look back on this period is indescribable, impossible to replicate in today's world. And if you were lucky enough to be born around late 1993, you witnessed a children's show that shook the United States to its core. On August 28th of that same year, the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers burst onto the scene, courtesy of Saban Entertainment and Renaissance Atlantic Entertainment. This Americanized version of the Japanese series Kyoryu Sentai Zur Ranger took the nation by storm. With action-packed scenes from the original show and reshoots featuring an all-American cast, Power Rangers became an instant hit. Kids couldn't get enough of it. It soared to become the highest rated kid show on TV, spawning a frenzy of action figures, games, merchandise, and even live performances. By 2001, the franchise had ranked in a mind-boggling $6 billion in toy sales. Critics may have scoffed at the show's initial production quality and dialogue, but its campy charm won over the hearts of countless children. Power Rangers became a household name, paving the way for a slew of live-action hero shows that followed in a similar format. The success of Power Rangers and its merchandising prowess caught the attention of TV executives everywhere. They realized the untapped potential in this market and set their sights on the next big Japanese import. Little did anyone know, this move would forever shape our introduction to Japanese media in the early 90s. Mighty Morphin Power Rangers became a pivotal starting point, sparking discussions about imported children's media in the West and influencing the localization process in North America. Companies like Renaissance Atlantic, partnering with Toy Animation and Bandai America, led the charge in repurposing Japanese IP for American audiences. At the helms of this operation was Frank Ward, the head and CEO of both Bandai America and Renaissance Atlantic. Ward conceptualized American adaptations based on Toy Animation's vault of Japanese IP. Collaborating with Saban Entertainment, they crafted creations like the iconic Power Rangers. Working alongside the animation company Toon Makers, they even produced a live-action animated hybrid of Sailor Moon, famously known by fans as Saban Moon. They developed a fully animated spin-off of the original Saints Seiya anime with Fred Wolf Films. Of course, these would all be proof of concept and pilot pitches and would never formally make it to air. Even still, their ambition to transform anime for the American market seemed to know no bounds. Through my investigations chronicled in Tales of the Lost, I have learned of the existence of more of these abandoned pilots, sizzle pitches, and early scripts from Renaissance Atlantic. According to those who worked at the company, any Japanese IP from Bandai that had a semblance of popularity was already in talks to be adapted. Stored away in the vaults of the Library of Congress, these hidden gems shed light on a historic moment in anime history. They reveal the potential alternate paths that our early introduction to anime in America could have taken. And now, I am determined to uncover these remaining missing pieces, to reveal the secrets that have been hidden from the public eye. I believe in the end that these revelations will reshape our understanding of how anime in America became a cultural phenomenon in the United States. In tonight's thrilling episode of Tales of the Lost, I embark on a daring mission to make direct contact with the elusive Frank Ward. With my resources dwindling, I had one goal in mind, to extract valuable information about the elusive Starstorm pilot hidden away in the depths of the Library of Congress. But that's not all. I aim to secure access to the entire treasure trove of Renaissance Atlantic's forgotten work, unveiling the secrets of other lost anime concepts once destined for adaptation. 
Ocean. My previous interactions with Frank Ward had been through an intermediary, leaving much room for silence and uncertainty. As an older and reclusive figure, there was a real possibility that I might not hear back from him this time. It was a risky move going directly to the source, and two fears gnawed at the back of my mind. Firstly, the dreaded realization that some files may be missing, buried, or even lost forever within the labyrinth of corridors of the Library of Congress. And secondly, the haunting possibility that Frank would refuse my request for a face-to-face -face meeting, leaving me stranded at square one. But the allure of solving this mystery once and for all, obtaining the Starstorm pilot, and closing the chapter on the quest for the remaining anime adaptations was too strong to resist. I was willing to wait, to endure whatever it took. Would I uncover all the answers I sought wrapped neatly in a bow? Or would my sunk cost fallacy amount to absolutely nothing but hopelessness and utter defeat? But before we can get into that, I wanted to give a special shout out to the brilliant minds at Black Magic Design for a game-changing tool that has revolutionized my documentary filmmaking. Shooting video solo is no easy task, but thanks to the Black Magic Video Assist, the whole process has become a breeze. This portable marvel is not just a monitor, recorder, or viewfinder, it's all of them combined. When I'm out shooting episodes of Tales of the Lost with my trusty Pocket Cinema 4K, I face a common challenge. The camera with its stunning cinematic capabilities lacks a convenient flip screen. And that's where the video assist steps in. It's like having my own personal crew member, constantly showing me real-time footage, ensuring I'm perfectly centered and in focus. No more running back and forth between takes to check my recordings, I can hit all my marks with precision. If you're itching to get your hands on the video assist, check out the link in the description box below for their product page. Blackmagic offers this gem in different sizes, a 5 inch and a 7 inch touchscreen, both equipped with 3G and 12G storage options. Trust me, this gadget has significantly reduced the time it takes for me to record live action sequences. It's honestly been a game changer. And now that we've got the tech talk out of the way, buckle up as we dive deeper into our investigation of the lost anime of Renaissance Atlantic. Last time you saw me... No, not that time. There we go. The last time you saw me, we embarked on an intriguing quest to unravel the secrets behind the American live-action spin-off of Saint Seiya, famously known as Starstorm, a hidden pilot concept tucked away in the Renaissance Atlantic archives, made in the hopes of rebranding the anime into something executives believed would be more palpable to North American audiences. Though completely transfixed on finding this full pilot, I somehow wound up making a completely different discovery. Another adaptation of Saint Seiya by the 
same company, this time a fully animated television pilot called Guardians of the Cosmos. When the tape had landed in my hands, it was delivered with an accompanying description of contents, much like other motion pictures submitted to the Library of Congress. This tiny detail reignited any hopes I had at finding Starstorm once and for all. I believed that somewhere in the depths of the vault, more clues could be found. The infamous Starstorm trailer, which had gained viral fame, was among the Starstorm media that had been submitted to the Library of Congress, supposedly along with portions of the pilot script. Yet, in my eyes, the library submission had one glaring difference to that of the viral trailer. While it may not have contained the entire pilot episode, I knew there was a chance that, similar to Guardians of the Cosmos, sure enough, the VHS submission of the trailer was bound to also contain a separate description of contents. This crucial page could potentially hold more clues about the other individuals involved in making this pilot. It was knowledge of this that had thrusted me back into my search and was my main motivation behind wanting to seek out the former CEO of Renaissance Atlantic and Bandai America, Frank Ward. However, with the knowledge that other potentially lost anime adaptations existed, my mission branched into two distinct paths, unveiling the description of contents for Starstorm and unearthing all hidden materials related to the rumored spin-offs like Gundam and Dragon Ball. Contacting Frank became imperative. But before I could see this through, I wanted to make sure I was fully prepared. The last thing I wanted was to walk away with a gnawing sense of regret, haunted by the questions I didn't think to ask vital to my pursuit. So I decided to piece together all my previous clues in a comprehensive map. While my previous investigations had covered significant ground, there were two interviews that went undocumented in my series. And this is because much of the contents of those sit-downs were unrelated to my very specific documentaries on Sailor Moon and Saint Seiya. These were the interviews with Ellen Aronson and a brief follow-up with Toon Maker's Rocky Solotov that I had mentioned diving into some months back. Early on in my pursuit of lost media on Sailor Moon, I'd come across the LinkedIn profile of an Ellen Aronson. After reaching out, I wound up hearing back from her sometime after the documentary had gone live. We sat down for a brief conversation over the phone, and Ellen was able to recall the following details about her time working at Renaissance Atlantic. Ellen had worked as a development and production executive at Renaissance Atlantic from 1994 to 1997 and had begun her relationship with the company when she was just 25. As the entertainment arm for the Japanese toy company Bandai, Ellen oversaw the production for an array of live-action children's television series. She was also instrumental in the creation of several one-sheets, art bibles, and video pilots, many of which remain lost media to this day. Ellen distinctly remembered working on a Sailor Moon pitch sizzle press presentation where they had hired a voice actress that sounded similar to American actress Susan Sarandon. This aforementioned pitch sizzle was more than likely the sizzle that I had attempted to retrieve from the Library of Congress archives before being informed that said material had been lost and misplaced within the facility. Ellen remarked that her favorite experience was working on the rumored live-action Gundam pilot episode, though she could not recall how far along in the project the team had gotten before it was abandoned. She reminisced on how how exciting it was to have been thrusted into an executive role in the entertainment industry at only 25, and recalled her feelings of excitement accompanying Frank to conferences and network events where they would pitch several anime adaptations. When I asked Ellen if she knew anything about the Dragon Ball adaptation, as the logo had been trademarked by Renaissance Atlantic on August 16th of 1994, she had mentioned not being able to recall if that project had been presented as a reanimation or as a live-action spin-off and that it was a project she had not been as involved with. Though Ellen had confirmed that after the idea had been abandoned, the team would go on to produce the September 1995 series known as WMAC Masters, a live-action martial arts show hosted by Shannon Lee, daughter of legendary actor and martial artist Bruce Lee. With how Renaissance Atlantic had a tendency to recycle and revisit ideas, there was a very strong likelihood that whatever concepts had been drafted up for Dragon Ball would have very likely ended up being reused in some way 
for WMAC Masters. How many remnants of the Americanized Dragon Ball existed in this series, I don't think we'll ever know. Towards the end of our discussion, Ellen had left me with a few key names of toy developers, agents, and even a name of the supposed person who had been hired as cameraman to shoot the behind-the-scenes footage for the live-action Sailor Moon pilot. The same person Rocky Solitoff and Steven Wiltzbach had mentioned briefly in our last interview. My sit-down with Rocky was much more brief. Though our conversation veered more into the dubbing history of Fox as a whole, Rocky was still able to give me a bit of insight into some of the adaptations in the works at Renaissance Atlantic. I learned that at that time, Haim Saban of Saban Entertainment and composer Shuki Levy, who were responsible for the English soundtrack of the ocean dub of Dragon Ball Z, were also asked to produce music for the supposed 1994 Americanized Dragon Ball adaptation. With Shuki Levy involved in both projects, I wondered if perhaps tunes like the iconic Rock the Dragon theme song had originally been produced for the American series only to be reused for the Ocean dub. Shuki Levy was also the genius behind the iconic Mighty Morphin Power Rangers theme song, a very energetic and rock-heavy sound. With that in mind, I could totally see a song like Rock the Dragon accompanying some sort of live-action iteration of Dragon Ball. While unrelated to Renaissance Atlantic directly, I was told that Rocky Solotov had worked behind the scenes on the original Fox Kids English dub of the anime Flint the Time Detective, and that when altering the names of the Japanese characters, the writers had decided to name the character Rocky Hammerhead, Flint Hammerhead's father, after Rocky Solotov himself. On top of Fox producing English dubs for Flint the Time Detective and Moncoli Knights, the company had previously made plans to dub the anime Doto Koni-chan, an anime series based on real-life Japanese wrestler Kanishiki Yasakshi. Though by the early 2000s, thousands, many of these planned concepts had fizzled out completely. All of this newfound information left for such a fascinating speculation, and was the perfect sort of information I could use to create more in-depth questions for Frank if and when we ever had our sit-down. Revisiting my interviews with Rocky and Ellen had given me a lot of new information to speculate on, and lucky for me, there were still more leads around the corner with information that could aid in my future discussions with Frank. Shortly after my Saint Seiya documentary had concluded, Marlene had reached out to me on my investigation. She revealed that after our initial encounter, she stumbled upon a hidden trove of forgotten treasures relating to the early production days of the American Sailor Moon. Marlene then proceeded to share a handful of photos photos of her findings, and these images that had came in had left me in awe. I was sent what I could only presume was an early sketch of Luna from the Toon Maker's adaptation, a few pages of the book Moville that had been submitted to the Library of Congress, and a handful of concept art and sketches of the lead characters from Team Angel in formal attire. The concept art of Team Angels bore a similarity to the prototype dolls Marlene had shared with me during our previous interview. She had revealed that the Team Angel sketches had been drafted up by Leslie Lee Hamill, the stepdaughter of American actress Suzanne Somers. My mind buzzed with questions, especially about Luna's design. Was this an early incarnation of Artemis, or had Luna been intended to be a male from the start? Perhaps this would explain her color shift from black to white in the pilot episode. The thirst for knowledge consumed me, and I yearned to uncover the truth behind these captivating photos. Thankfully, Marlene agreed to sit down and do another meeting. I was hopeful that with her new findings, perhaps further memories of what had taken place behind the scenes would now take center stage. Hi Marlene, thanks so much for sitting down with me again. It's good to hear from you. Hello again, Ray. <laughs> it's nice to be with you for another documentary. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here. What is the story behind these newly shared photos? Are the doll prototypes that were shared previously based off of these character designs? The answer is yes, sort of. So the dolls, surprisingly, were lost for many, many years. And after I appeared in your Saint Seiya documentary, which was magnificent, congratulations, I went looking for some of the artifacts from my employ at Renaissance Atlantic. 
Atlantic. And I have a ton of stuff. I even have furniture from the apartment. I mean, not from the apartment, from the office. I have office, old office furniture and toys and, and lots of stuff because the moving out of the office process was quite chaotic at the time. And Frank was downsizing his abode as well as the office. And so I was able to take a lot of stuff. I put some stuff in storage for him. He moved some stuff to his new apartment. Anyway, a lot of stuff got lost in the shuffle. Um, some stuff I see every day. I've got a bookcase here that you might recognize from the photos, but I found the dolls. I found the Sailor Moon uh, ish Team Angel dolls that are in the picture that I had sent to you for the Saint Saint documentary, and I will proceed to show them to you right now. Here's one. Here's another, <laughs> and. Uh, you might recognize this doll, and, and this one too. Th this is actually a Mattel Barbie. This one is a, an Amber from Clueless, also Mattel, I believe. You can see their little uh, shoes. So we just use these dolls as like hangers. You can think of them as hangers or mannequins. So we didn't have them created from scratch, but we did have the costumes created from scratch. So what I had sent to you was a photo of all the dolls grouped on top of a filing cabinet. And lo and behold, they were in a box in the back of my closet with some other stuff that I will, I will show you shortly. But um, anyway, as, as far as I remember, the process was we, we had a, a bunch of Barbies that we bought and then we hired a costume designer. I believe her name was Nan Iwasaki. I think she was the one who got the job. Um, we, we did solicit some test designs from a variety of costume designers, I guess, costume designer slash artist slash doll and toy stylists and we awarded the job to one of them. And I think Nan Iwasaki was the one who did the, the things that appeared in the pilot for Team Angel, which is a modern, or it was modern in the early 2000s, reimagining of Sailor Moon. Uh, I say we, I was not involved in the hiring process or anything like that, but it's we in the sense that these, Little angels are now in my charge and rescued from the back of my closet and a big box. So anyway, there's there are several of them, but there are two that are missing. Um, the two that are missing were stolen in an office break-in, I guess in the early 2000s. So I, I do remember the office break-in. Um, so those those are gone with the wind. But anyway, got the, these two beauties, got these two. You can see, oh, I, I know, oh yeah, yeah, these are special shoes. Yeah, she's got this special shoes that are designed to go with the outfits. And again, to a uh, Teresa and a Barbie, just serving as models for the costumes that you will recognize from the Team Angel sizzle uh, or pilot, whatever you want to call it. And then here are the two more survivors. Whoops, uh-oh, some shoes fell on the floor. Okay, <laughs> here are the last two. They're a little um, disheveled from the trauma of being in the box in the back of my closet for years, but they survived. I think her shoes were on the floor. Um, and speaking of shoes, I also found this. Oh, wait, here's one of the, the missing shoes that fell off of this girl. There you go. And then um, I also found this, a bag of shoes. But the, I think that these were intended to go with the dolls, but as you, well, you might be able to see, but these are for some big feet. They've been customized for the costumes. You can see some of these little stars fell to the bottom of the package. But the, I don't know if these were ordered or if someone made them and then realized they were the wrong size. I don't know how I ended up with all this, but uh, I've got shoes that need adults or dolls to go with them. So there's that. And then um, this is just a, a bonus. This was something else I inherited when the office closed down, was this cool Sailor Moon doll from Japan. And I'm not sure when this was made, but um, it's an oldie. 
but a goodie like me. <laughs> and uh, there's the back of the box. It's got all the, the um, original series art on it and so forth. So that's that. So that's a long answer to question number one on your list. Oh, yes, and the designs. Um, the the I sent you some character designs and costume designs. Those were all from a variety of different artists. One of the artists though, Leslie, Leslie, oh, what is her last name? I can't remember. It's probably on the, the art, which I don't have near me. I, I've got a, <laughs> a mess going on here of stuff that's pulled from the orifices of my apartment. But Leslie, I want to say Handel, Handler, Chandler, something like that. But anyway, she is the daughter of Suzanne Summers, the actress. And she was one of the costume designer or doll costume designers who was vying for the position of costume designer for the dolls. So we were at the same time, and I, I, I say we, <laughs> again, not, not really that I was in the trenches in this process, but I heard the stories and I observed a few things here and there. Um, but she and a number of other costume designers were in contention for this job to design the dolls as well as develop the series, which only really got as far as the pilot, which the internet has seen, thanks to Frank sharing it generously. Was this to be a sketch concept of Luna? Was she brainstormed to be a male cat? Or is this her companion from the Japanese anime, Artemis? I do not know. I just found a stack of designs. I found those before we did your Saint Seiya video documentary. And um, I don't have a lot of, or really any information that goes with them. It's just a bunch of concept designs. Although I think the one that you pointed out, the, um, the male cat was by a really talented artist who I'm still in touch with, Stephanie Pyron Fortell. And I don't think that those designs were intended to be made into toys. I think that that was for the series. I think she she did development art for the pilot and also for the ensuing series that never did happen. Since making these finds, have you found any other concept art or artifacts that you'd be willing to share for this documentary? I did uh, identify some furniture in my place that is from Frank's old office, but um, I'm not gonna... <laughs> I'm not gonna take the camera around this too much. And and then there are some other toys and things that I have around here, but I think I showed you the most important stuff that your, your viewers here would really wanna see because it relates to Sailor Moon and the slightly updated version of Team Angel. Do you know anything about the Tamagotchi TV series that was in the works? Yes, I remember the Tamagotchi series that was in the works and I remember some development being done on it. I can't remember if there were any writers hired or artists. I don't know if it got that far, but the decision was made at some point to save money on development and to just take Digimon, uh, and the, the, the existing Digimon series that had come from Japan and just take those scripts, have them translated, have them localized or reversioned, and then to dub the Digimon cartoon. So Digimon is, that was what happened with the Tamagotchi series. It, it, be, it became Digimon. And then the, the development only reached a certain point and then the decision was made a joint decision between Bandai and Renaissance Atlantic and um, Saban to just do the dubbing it instead. So I don't have, I couldn't find any of the Tamagotchi development material. So I don't know if that was trashed or. When checking the Library of Congress, I had also noticed entries for shows titled Revolution and Colony 4G V9. Would you happen to know if those were possible anime adaptations or original Renaissance Atlantic titles? I don't know. Those don't sound familiar at all. Uh, they might have predated my employ at Renaissance Atlantic, but 
I'm sorry, I don't have those answers. While a Gundam pilot was being adapted by Renaissance Atlantic, another studio owned by Bandai had been working on an Americanized cartoon of their own known as the Doozy Bots. Do you know of anyone who worked at Anoki Films that I could get in touch with? I'm aware Mona Marshall had voice acted in this pilot, but it's been very difficult to find a production team. I don't, I don't know. I don't know anything about that. Although I do remember during my employee, there were some Gundam toys that came to the office and there was something being done at one point. But, um, but I think, I think what happened through the years with Renaissance Atlantic, projects came and went and maybe years would happen, years would, would transpire and someone would come to the realization that, hey, maybe there's something we can do with this now. So maybe there was an idea to do a Gundam project at one point in time and then it died and then two years later somebody else said hey what about Gundam and then there would be a bunch of activity and then it would die again and then maybe a year later it would come back and who's to say why those things happen. They were business decisions, obviously, as opposed to creative. It was usually not the case that somebody would say, hey, I've got a great take on Gundam. Not anything like that. It was mostly like, hey, Gundam sales are up or Gundam toy sales are down. We need to boost them. Let's let's put some media behind that. We would love to know what you've been working on since our last encounter. Are there any upcoming projects that you'd like to let us know about? Why, thank you for asking. And there's there's so much, but I'll pick some of the highlights. I am attached to a feature film franchise as executive producer. It's called Young Captain Nemo. The development announcement was made in 2022. You can Google it and find the variety announcements and so forth. Now, there is a strike going on in Hollywood right now, so any razzle-dazzle with my plans that I share with you here, it, everything's on hold because most of the town is on strike. But anyway, I'm attached to Young Captain Nemo. I'm also working with a studio called Neko Productions, which I I have collaborated with Neko previously, once during my Sega tenure um, on Sonic Mania Adventures. I had been instrumental in hiring Neko to do that animation. And then I worked with Neko again on a level five series called Snack World, which is on Crunchyroll right now if you want to watch it. And now um, I'm, I reunited with Neko, which is based here in Los Angeles, and we're embarking on a number of different things. So stay tuned for that. Nothing I can talk about at this point in time. And then um, another thing that I'm really proud of is my work with the neurodiverse animators of the Center for Learning Unlimited and the companion studio Brainstorm Productions. So Brainstorm employs the graduates of the Center for Learning Unlimited's three-year animation training program for adults on the autism spectrum. And um, we started Brainstorm actually during the pandemic. So I, I've been working with Brainstorm and CLU for a little over three years, and we started the studio to give employ, employment to this team of animators who had graduated from the program. So they graduated, uh, CLU graduated its first class during the pandemic, and now we're getting ready to graduate the third class. And so the students finish the program and then they go into Brainstorm Productions and they become professional animators. And part of what I do is finding commissions for them to work on. So if anybody out there in TV land has a project that would benefit from some fantastic animation by a team of very talented, neurodiverse artists, please message me because uh, we've got a bunch of folks who have a whole lot of energy and enthusiasm and are ready to work. And um, one of our films is making its way on the film festival circuit right now. It's called Willow's Tale. So keep an eye out for that. It might be coming to a movie theater near you. It's a short film. So anyway, Willow's Tale, Brainstorm Productions, and CLU. And uh, I guess those are that's the extent of the stuff that I'm able to share at this time. So thank Thanks again, Raven. This is a wonderful opportunity and you're doing such brilliant work for the fandom and educating folks about the history. So thanks again. Take care. It 
was good to get a chance to tie up all the loose ends that had been left over from my previous interview with Marlene, where I got more insight on all the new sketches she had uncovered. It seems there had been quite a few celebrity names behind the scenes who were excited to see what Saban Moon and Team Angel could have become if all the stars had aligned correctly. The success of the Power Rangers had executives buzzing with excitement, envisioning how they could transform Toy Animation's anime library into a gold mine. They seemed so far along into toy development and prototypes, almost more so than the work that went into the respective cartoon pilots. But in the American market, it was all about the almighty dollar, driven by toy sales. But I couldn't help but wonder if this insatiable hunger for profit had ultimately compromised the quality of these forgotten pilots, relegating them to the shadows of obscurity. Armed with this newfound information about Dragon Ball, Gundam, Sailor Moon, and Team Angel, I knew it was time to craft my letter to Frank Ward. I meticulously formulated in-depth questions, eager to present them to him. Yet, a nagging doubt crept in. With our only interaction being through a third party, I had no clue what dealing with Frank Ward would be like. All I really had were accounts from his former employees. I was gripped with fear. I was afraid that he would dismiss this entire endeavor as trivial, finding no value in a one-on-one -on -one conversation. But if I I wanted to inch closer to accessing the remaining treasures hidden in the Library of Congress, I had to make a move. This email would be one of the most crucial emails I'd ever sent. I assumed the role of an inquisitive journalist, acutely aware that the tone of my words could make or break the outcome of this interaction. I looked at my words once, twice, a hundred times over it felt like, and upon hitting send, I hoped it would erase my fears and anxieties that bubbled underneath. Days turned into weeks, and a month slipped by in silence. Fearing my efforts were in vain, I diverted my attention elsewhere, diving into a completely unrelated topic to preserve my sanity. But as time ticked closer to the second month, in the late hours of the night, a response from Frank finally arrived, shattering the silence. I must apologize for the laggard response. We have had rather large storms, as you no doubt know, so that changed lots of schedules. However, I am always happy to help enthusiasts about past projects. And as a matter of fact, two summers ago, I went up to New York City to meet with a journalist, Celia D'Agostino, I believe, who was working on a history of Sailor Moon. I know you have many questions, and I will be glad to try to fill things in for you. Naturally, we have done a lot of TV properties over the years, and my mindset is forward, rather than getting nostalgic and wringing my hands about my disappointments. Sailor Moon was unusually frustrating due to various rights holders in the US and Japan. When I recall negotiations, the deal to do a live-action version for America was what got us stuck. I knew we could turn Sailor into a classic hit property with all the bells and whistles. The Japanese market in insisted that their animation, toys, and figures were unchangeable. The Holy Grail. And therein lies the impasse. I think you are right about starting with a phone call. Let's try via email to find a date or time. I am in Florida, as you know. Cheers, Frank. My heart raced as I took in every word of his email, and without hesitation, I fired back a response. Hi Frank, I totally understand. The weather's been pretty turbulent in Toronto as well, but I'm happy to hear from you nonetheless. Yes, I have an immense respect for Cecilia, as she is quite the dedicated journalist. I do have many questions about your time building the company and the projects I had come across when browsing the Library of Congress some months ago. There are many people who are excited to hear what you have to say, and I was pleasantly surprised to see such an overwhelming amount of support from fans who are in awe of these Americanized pilots Renaissance had created. I hope you're able to take solace in the fact that your work has become a fascinating part of animation slash anime history, and that there is now a newfound love and appreciation for your previous television properties. It's really cool and is an exciting look at the relationship between Japanese and Western culture, especially during the 80s and 90s. Whatever date and time is most convenient for you, please let me know and I can make arrangements. Sincerely, Ray. 
But alas, anxiety gripped me once again as I found myself engulfed in a deafening silence. Days had once again turned into weeks, and I couldn't help but mull over our previous exchange. On one hand, I felt a sense of accomplishment having received a positive response and even securing a phone call. On the other hand, I couldn't decipher Frank's true sentiments about delving deeper into our discussion. His mentions of wanting to focus on the future rather than dwelling on disappointments left me puzzled. Perhaps the weight of my myriad of questions would prove to be too much for him to handle. Maybe this entire matter was a painful memory he wished to erase entirely, which would explain our sudden halt in communication. I feared that my insatiable curiosity might sabotage my chances, and I dreaded the thought of overstepping boundaries. If and when Frank was ready to share, I wanted to ensure I approached our conversation with preparedness, professionalism, and open arms. However, to achieve this, I knew I had to unravel the enigma that was Frank Ward. Our brief interaction offered only a glimpse into his persona, leaving me yearning to grasp for a complete understanding. I craved insight into the man behind Renaissance Atlantic. His behavior and patterns seemed somewhat sporadic, and with him having little to no footprint online, it was incredibly difficult to gauge how best to approach our interview. I longed to know what lay ahead before our actual encounter to be fully prepared for whatever awaited me. So I decided that the best course of action would be to get in touch with the person who had made my communication with Frank Ward possible in the first place. The former Kotaku, now Bloomberg journalist, Cecilia D'Anastasio. If we could sit down briefly and go over what it was like to meet him, I'm sure I would have a much better understanding on how to communicate with Frank and what to expect. Was he more blunt and sarcastic, lighthearted and conservative? Who better to ask than someone who actually met the man in the flesh when originally conducting her own investigation on the American Sailor Moon. While waiting to hear back from Frank, I decided to reach out to Cecilia. I wanted to gain more insight on her prior work in journalism, along with her first-hand encounter with Frank Ward, to better prepare myself for our time together. Cecilia D'Anastasio, the former Kotaku journalist who initially ran the story on her investigations into Saban Moon and chance meeting with Frank Ward that miraculously led her to discovering Renaissance Atlantic's second attempt at a Sailor Moon spin-off titled Team Angel. The same Cecilia that had so graciously reached out to Frank on my behalf, a remarkable journalist and fellow anime enthusiast. Cecilia possessed the same unquenchable thirst for adventure and a passion for unearthing lost media, much like myself. We would love to know a bit about yourself along with your background in journalism. I'm a journalist who covers the video game industry and digital culture for Bloomberg News. I've been covering video games and gaming in general since about 2014 through jobs at Kotaku and Wired and here. And I feel very lucky to do this work because in my view, games culture and like nerd culture in general is kind of this really exciting petri dish that's sort of incubating um, mainstream culture and technology, there are so many things that today we kind of take as granted as like pop culture that came from niches in, in the gaming world. And it's so cool to see that happening. And I love explaining concepts like VTubers to the business community. It's funny to see aspects of gaming culture hit the mainstream. And you'll often find that the ones that are explaining it to the masses seem to have less of an understanding of it because they come at it through a more corporate lens, as opposed to consulting people who are actually actually part of the culture. Yeah, I mean, it's deeply amusing to see CEOs basically pitching the plot of Sword Art online. So I love being kind of a translator and being like, actually, this thing you're calling the metaverse or this thing you're calling, you know, this or that, that's a thing that we're very familiar with as deep nerds. <laughs> Have you always been a fan of Sailor Moon? Did you have a big interest in anime prior to your search? Yeah, I am an enormous, enormous, enormous anime fan. Like I fully keep on my anime list, like all of it. My favorite director is Satoshi Kon, but these days I watch a lot of shoujo. I used to actually review anime at Kotaku. So even though that was a long time ago, I'm still a little bit burnt out on newer seasons. I used to have to watch through like all of the new seasons and be like, this is good, this is bad. So I've seen some shit 
bit. Um, I say this though to cushion the fact that when it comes to Sailor Moon, and I know this is totally sacrilegious, but I was never really a fan. Um, I say this in my article, but when Sailor Moon was on, I really didn't understand what was going on a lot of the time. Some of the themes I didn't really relate to, and it just wasn't my favorite. But I do remember I thought Sailor Pluto was a badass. I thought she was awesome. She was guarding like the space time continuum, right? Yes. She was badass. Yes. So please don't come at me for not being a big Sailor Moon fan. Big respect to all of y'all. When did you first hear whispers about the American Sailor Moon adaptation? So I was sitting at my desk at Kotaku and I was scrolling through Reddit as one does. And I saw this image of the eponymous American Sailor Moon. And I was like, lol, what? This is so weird and funny and improbable and like brain frizzing that I kind of just dropped everything to learn everything I could about it. And the more I dug, the more questions I had. I was completely obsessive. I think my bosses thought I was like insane, <laughs> but it paid off. I think any curious person online falls into internet holes every now and then. I feel very lucky to be a reporter. And so I was able to pursue it in that capacity. And I think that the answer to why I did pursue it is pretty simple, which is that I love a challenge. And this was definitely a challenge. How did you track down Frank Ward and how did it feel during your interview together after your discovery of Team Angel, an entirely different pilot concept? It was definitely something. I found Frank by tracking down an illustrator. Her name was Stephanie Fortell, who made this children's book with Frank in the late 90s. And the book was called Moville. If you look up a cover of this book, it is the most 90s book you've seen in your whole life. It is the most endearing thing. Stephanie was one of the many professional associates of Frank's that I had emailed. But you have to remember Frank, he was at the height of his power in like the 80s and 90s. And by the time I was looking for him in 2018, he had disappeared. He was retired and he had no internet footprint. So when I saw his email in my inbox the day after I had reached out to Stephanie, I felt the purest possible euphoria. Yeah, and Frank seemed like delighted to play the part of sought after source. I can read it for you. I have it in front of me. That would be great. His email was iconic. This is the first paragraph. He said, great detective work, Cecilia. You found Frank Ward, he of Sailor Moon Infamy. I was the founder and president of Renaissance Atlantic and expended an enormous amount of time and dollars trying to bring Toei Bandai's Japan hit series to the US. My concept was to produce a live action series to the US. Both Fox and Saban, with whom I had worked on Power Rangers and other shows, were all for it and planning had progressed. Dot, 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 until we hit the great wall of Japanese intrigue and enigma. When I got that email, I was like, ooh. <laughs> he seemed pretty open and willing to share his story. Judging from that, he sounds excited. Yeah, he was like clearly like, you found me. I'm ready for this. It must have also felt like an intense investigation, especially since she went as far as meeting with him in person. And I'm sure what had been even more exciting was the surprise reveal of a second Sailor Moon adaptation. Totally. It was, I mean, I say this in the story, but like when I actually sat down with Frank, he was in Florida. I'm, I'm in New York. He had a trip planned to come to New York. He found this VHS tape and we found this, uh, maybe it wasn't a VHS tape. It was, it was something that was a little harder to read. And we found this video archivist who was able to play it. So um, me, Chris Person, who was Kotaku's video editor at the time, and Frank met in Manhattan and Frank was like, this is it. Here it is. And he puts the tape in and it's T Angel and the theme song is playing and I am just like, this is not it. Had there been any more discussions of anime adaptations with Frank after the interview had concluded? From my discussions with other individuals who worked at Renaissance Atlantic, quite a few different anime were in talks for adaptation. The one I found most curious was the proposed Dragon Ball spinoff. Wow, that's so cool. And this is why you are such a great investigator and reporter. I honestly, I don't remember having those conversations with Frank because it was a little bit ago, but I do remember when we were talking about the idea that anime today had become so mainstream. He, you know, I don't want to say he looked a little sad, but he looked a little like wistful. Like he, and you have to imagine like Frank Ward in the eighties had this twinkle in his eye that this Japanese product was going to be part of mainstream American culture one day. And I'll never forget leaving the building after we had seen the fake American Sailor Moon. 
Toon, Team Angel, and asking him like, you know, do you know about anime conventions? Do you know about cosplay? Do you know about this and that? And all of the trappings of modern anime culture. And he just kind of looked at me and he was like, no, I didn't, I didn't know about that. So anyway, that's a long way of answering your question, which is that I, I don't know about other discussions, but I'm sure there were a lot. He really wanted to create toys, if I recall correctly, based off of products that he brought over. And I guess he saw the potential of anime to generate, you know, all of this merchandise that, I mean, at least for me, is like cluttering my office today. I admire all of the lengths you went to uncovering that story. It was a really great example of investigative journalism. Was it your first time taking on a lost media subject? I mean, you're really the expert on lost media. To me, this project was not distinguishable from tracking down sources like I do in my other investigations. And, you know, it required the same skills. And, and truthfully, I didn't track down the lost media. You you did. And I just told a good story about my failed attempt. I found this other weird thing and I made, a, you know, I made an article about it. But I, I will say this, like in terms of tracking down lost media, I know I said that I wasn't a huge fan of Sailor Moon growing up, but as a huge anime fan, I track down lost media all the time. There are so many properties that haven't gotten brought over to the US or are just impossible to purchase DVDs of or, or even VHS tapes or anything. And I am constantly looking for episodes of shows, looking for even, um, I was trying to find Masaki Yuasa, a famous director, his Kimono Zume anime, which I had heard was really cool and integral to him developing his style, which I loved in Devilman Crybaby. It's like, if I Finding stuff like that and like trying to just understand the medium. I think a lot of anime experts have a lot of experience taking on lost media subjects. And for me, I just happen to also be a journalist. Just the whole process of exploring lost media, even if it's not found in the end, that whole process can feel like an adventure. It's really exciting, I think. But like, I also want to say that, again, like I was really lucky in that I had this great platform to publish this story, but there were so many awesome investigations into the American Sailor Moon, both before and after I published what I published. And I cited those in my initial article, just like you cited me in your, in your YouTube video. All of it's like a really big group effort. And I think that's one of the great things about uh, anime fandom. We would love to learn more about your works if you have any upcoming projects you'd like to share. Yeah, my articles are on, on Bloomberg News where I work. Definitely check them out. I also want to shout out while we're talking about my article. So I definitely threw my back into the investigation, but a lot of you wouldn't have read that article without the gorgeous jaw-dropping illustration of my very good friend, Chelsea Beck, who is just the most genius, talented illustrator on the face of the planet. She spent like all night drawing this just stunning, stunning illustration of the American Sailor Moon. She looks like the Statue of Liberty. I think it's like the New York skyline in the background. I just wanted to shout her out. It's just, it's brilliant. And I think a lot of people wouldn't have clicked on the article without her hard work. And she's a huge, she's like a huge anime fan. Like we watch anime anime together all the time. And I think for her, like this assignment, she was like, absolutely. There was also one person that we both have to thank that was pretty much at the core of this entire Saban moon search and was the reason so many people even came to hear about this adaptation. It was the website, The Moon Sisters. Yes. Coriander. Yeah, I definitely wanted to give Coriander a shout out because they did such great detective work also in amassing all of this source material. Same here, I definitely used their site as a major reference point for my search. A lot of the Saban Moon investigations and even public inquiry wouldn't have been possible without the work they put into documenting everything at the time. And it's amazing, the website's been up all of these years and is still thriving. So thank you, Coriander. Thank you so much for doing this amazing investigative work. I love your videos. Based on what Cecilia had shown me of her interactions with Frank Ward, I was a little more confident that I could expect a lighthearted and almost laid-back atmosphere when conducting my own interview with him. My fears began to dissipate as Cecilia spoke of his genuine excitement when she first reached out. Frank embraced the role of a sought-after source in her journalistic investigation, even inviting Cecilia and her team to his home for a more thorough search of the Sailor Moon pilot. Despite not dwelling on what he perceived as personal failure, 
failures, Frank appeared eager to offer insights into his past projects. Little did he realize the profound impact his efforts could have had on the early introduction of anime to countless North Americans. He seemed unaware of the significance that lost pilots like Saban Moon or Guardians of the Cosmos held for anime fans and preservationists. Considering his age and the generational gap, it came as no surprise that he hadn't kept up with the overseas success of the Japanese medium since his time working at Renaissance Atlantic and Bandai in the early 90s. Not being aware of the annual events like anime conventions and whatnot, I wondered what his reaction would be learning of anime's widespread influence on culture since the 90s. Luckily, fortune smiled upon me as the long-awaited moment to confront Frank had finally arrived. After enduring what felt like an eternity, Frank emerged from the shadows. But before we can continue, I'd just like to take a moment to express my gratitude for all of your continued support for this ongoing series. Tales of the Lost is a series that is very near and dear to me. It is basically my baby and my main passion project. I get so much enjoyment out of making cinematic pieces on some of my favorite bits of Lost media, and being able to investigate and share my findings has brought a new sense of joy to my life. All I want to do right now is make entertaining content and produce my own series, and the reception to Tales of the Lost has been everything I could have asked for, and I'd love to continue doing this series for a very long time. But unfortunately, this passion project can come at a bit of a cost. With all of the time spent making these, I'm sometimes unable to land a decent sponsor. Other times, these sorts of videos are subject to the smallest of copyright claims. The process of making an episode of Tales of the Lost is usually quite lengthy, where I spend almost two months investigating a topic, and then another month dedicated to writing, filming, and editing the entire video. So with no content being pushed in that time between uploads, I lose my ranking in the YouTube algorithm, and by the time I post a new video, I decrease my chance of discovery by being away for so long, and your support could really go a long way in helping to keep this channel afloat, because with more likes and more shares, the more the video will gain discoverability, which can in turn draw in more and better sponsors. And if you'd like to take it a step further and support me monetarily, there are a few ways in which you can do that, whether it be tipping as a one-time payment through Super Thanks once the video goes live, through my Ko-fi, or even signing up to Patreon. Donating as little as a dollar on Patreon can grant you special access to to our community Discord server and other behind the scenes perks that don't make it to the documentaries. To put this impact into perspective, if we got around 2,000 viewers to donate a dollar each month, that would be $2,000 that would help go towards better equipment, research, Library of Congress documents, subtitles, and other necessary fees that go into making these hour long deep dives. That amount of support would honestly be life changing. Thank you for your continued love and support. This means a lot to me, and I want to continue making high quality content and entertaining episodes that people can sit back with and enjoy. With that being said, thank you and please enjoy the remainder of this program. After delving into past interviews that unveiled the hidden stories of Renaissance Atlantic, reconnecting with Marlene to unearth lost concept art, and engaging in a conversation with Cecilia about her relentless pursuit of Saban Moon and her encounter with Frank Ward, I had amassed enough knowledge to fuel my own line of questioning. And now, the moment I had been yearning for had arrived. Weeks had passed, but finally, sometime later, Frank crafted his response. I've had you in mind now far too long. Apologies. Pure lazy procrastination to some extent caused by fractured vertebrae. Mine, not Sailor's. As I said, Sailor was one of those oh so close projects, endemic to the business. But you have triggered my nostalgia button. Once upon a time, I was president of Bandai North America in California in a turnaround mode. It became clear to me that the key to success in this business, circa 1988, meant finding or creating TV slash movie characters to drive sales, rather than off-the-shelf toys and games using ads alone. Bandai Japan then was excellent at this approach to product-related TV characters, mainly in cooperation with film producers, in Japan, but not elsewhere. 
They had never leveraged that in America or Europe. After several years of running Bandai America, I suggested to Makoto Yamashina, the president of Bandai Worldwide who I had known personally before joining the company, that we had to create a separate arm to deal with TV, for both existing Japanese and original concepts. I would create my own entity, financed by me, with an understanding I would be retained exclusively to represent Bandai properties for TV. It gets complicated after that. E.g., I had to set up a Dutch holding company known as Renaissance Atlantic Films in order to meet France's regulations, that 50% of content being European Union origin production of films. My name, FW, therefore can pop up as RAF or RA. The tricky part with Sailor Moon was that while Bandai Japan had toy rights, Toei had film rights. So Bandai could not control what Toei did with the Japanese animation. Those toys were okay in Japan, but not of a quality for the US or Europe. Nor was the animation at that time appealing to TV buyers. Nobody wanted the existing show. My idea was to rewrite the basic story, but do it live action. Toei insisted on using their show. The standoff began. Kids, of course, would watch anything on TV, but that did not equate to sufficient revenue. Kids TV shows do not, on their own, drive product sales. Networks pay very little, if anything, for the show. As a result of the impasse, Deke Entertainment offered to take the shows and simply substitute English. We would not do that. End of story. And all they ever did was syndicated TV in odd places and odd times. A lost opportunity because the idea of a girl's action show was unique, especially when there were none. That fans existed, I know well, but really the show was never widely distributed, nor did licensed products catch on. And as you know, I worked with Rocky to make that short live-action film. I own that. We did show it to a few key customers, but at the time could not promise any TV support. Proof of the pudding, we applied the same approach with an obscure Japanese series that became Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Q.E.D. I agree that a phone call would be sensible. Early January for me is fine, but please propose a few options. If it helps, I could do a short call this Friday, the 16th. With Frank's approval, I eagerly prepared to unleash my arsenal of questions. Months of relentless research on Renaissance Atlantic's vast collection of pilots had culminated into a formidable backlog of inquiries. This treasure trove of information was now poised for transmission, a concise yet comprehensive list of questions, each with its own subcategories. I spent time thoroughly crafting out my inquiries, making sure to layer my questions and provide video links of the lost media that had remained online, and visual aids were plentiful and strategically included to jog Frank's memory and ignite his dormant recollections. Even still, some twinge of guilt crept up on me, fearing the sheer magnitude of my inquiries might overwhelm him. I extended an offer of assistance, assuring Frank that I stood ready to clarify any uncertainties. Additionally, I emphasized my understanding should he feel uncomfortable answering certain queries. To my astonishment, Frank's response exuded an unexpected fervor. It was as if my questions had unlocked a hidden passion within him, a flame that neither he nor I could have foreseen. I just opened this! Mondur! First, I might say that your research on all of this remarkable. My word, Starstorm? I'd completely forgotten. We were all excited by it, as with Sailor Moon. I don't think I even kept that live action Saint Seiya. Might have shot it in Vancouver. Done lived, it would have done bomb, as the Brits use the term. Oh, so close. Only counts in horseshoes. Both ran into the realities of Japan Incorporated. Once again, the toy rights and the film rights were separate. And again, both projects failed to achieve the heights they should have climbed. So now I am fully entangled in your project, albeit annoyed all over. When I saw Starstorm, it led me to this. I get 
angry all over seeing this Jen Fukunaga, my nemesis. Somehow he was related or connected to the film rights holder in Japan. Funimation was a front for someone. Jen was all ego, listening to nobody, and he failed, running a sure thing by playing Hollywood. Big shot. Still irritates me. If he is a friend of yours, I had long forgotten all that. Until now. We got a few right as it turned out. Jungle Lords, on the other hand, was entirely yours truly. <laughs> we'll explain. I had that poster for years for my told you so file. God knows where it is now. Aside, my attitude is that if we never slow up, we never get old. Looking back is a kind of disease against which there should be a vaccine. Poor video, but the message speaks. Tomorrow at 2. Frank's passion was infectious, garnering my undivided attention. As I delved deeper into the enigmatic world of the lost works from Renaissance Atlantic, a simmering rivalry between two titans of the English anime market emerged from the shadows. It appeared that Frank Ward, with an unyielding animosity, held a seething grudge against Gen Fukunaga, the CEO of Funimation. This deep-rooted animosity, still ablaze after all these years, added a tantalizing layer to the ever-growing mystery. My mind whirled with a multitude of questions, consumed by an insatiable curiosity. How did Gen Fukunaga, the well-respected head of Funimation, serve as the foil to Frank Ward? Was this a mere misunderstanding, or was there more controversy at work here than anyone could have ever realized? What sort of war had silently been brewing with in the anime localization community. The rabbit hole grew deeper, unveiling new complexities that plagued my every thought. Everything would be fully explained tomorrow at 2. I could finally get to the bottom of all this. After my year-long investigation, the time had come to unravel this colossal what-if and confront the man at the heart of it all. Find out what happens next in part 2 of the lost anime of Renaissance Atlantic, The Vindication of Frank Ward. Truth was that